My name is Artem Dynaberg. I'm an employee at Raytheon Company, and I'm here to talk to you about a vulnerability I discovered that's called bit squatting. So uh, I like to start these things off with uh, the problem. And uh, the problem is that you may be compromised even when you're following the very best recommended security practices. And uh, I'm going to give you a more detailed idea of what exactly I mean. So let's pretend you're a user somewhere in the world and you're browsing Facebook. And when you browse Facebook, a lot of things get requested in the background, such as JavaScript, CSS, and images. And sometimes those things aren't requested from Facebook. Sometimes they're requested from a domain really close to Facebook. And if a malicious entity controls that domain, then they can serve up content to your browser. And uh, Facebook isn't the only site that's vulnerable. Actually, any internet site is vulnerable. And as we will see later, the more popular a site is, the more vulnerable it actually is. But uh, I guess a bunch of you are thinking, well, I know I run the latest hardened operating system that this isn't something I should worry about. But you're probably wrong. Uh, the problem itself is hardware and operating system agnostic. On the slide is uh, actual platforms that I have seen request content from my domains instead of their intended domains. But you're probably wondering, OK, since this is platform agnostic, it must mean it uh, takes a lot of uh, skills to do this. Uh, you would be wrong. Bit squatting is actually extremely easy. There's no complicated reverse engineering. There's no ROP chains or heap manipulation or kernel exploits. There's no O-Day required. Uh, all you need is, one, the ability to do some basic math, two, be able to register domains, and uh, three, be able to uh, host those domains. So uh, you're probably thinking, well, if the skill level's low, there's got to be another difficult barrier to entry, such as money or something like that. And uh, the answer is no. No, there's not. Bit squatting is actually extremely cheap. As I said, all you need is some basic math and domain registration. And domain registration is increasingly cheap. It costs about $8 to register a .com domain. And uh, criminal gangs have been known to set up entire name servers and entire registrars for their criminal purposes. And uh, server hosting is also extremely easy. It can be compromised, or you can purchase bulletproof hosting for sale on the black market. And if you read the, the title slide, this vulnerability is called bit squatting. The reason they call it bit squatting is because it operates like typo squatting, but for bits. And uh, while bit squatting relies on humans to make mistakes, typo squatting relies on computers to make mistakes. So a little background on typo squatting. We're all familiar with it, or at least I hope. For, so you want to go to Google, but you type an extra G, and you end up going to Goggle, where instead of a search engine, you can win Walmart gift cards or uh, iPads, but sadly, not the MacBook Air this time. It's uh, out of stock. And uh, typo squatting is not what I'm talking about. For bit squatting to work, absolutely no typing is required. And the reason for that is, that uh, while humans are very prone to mistakes, computers make a lot more DNS queries. The uh, graph you see here is actually to scale. The uh, typo squatters are going after that little man in uh, the top right, whereas bit squatting affects uh, all of those server icons. And uh, a little bit about the slide. I get the 1500 number from uh, the OpenDNS blog. In March of 2011, they had an entry saying that for the, a day in March that they'd received 30 billion requests. And if you go to the OpenDNS website, they have 20 million users. Doing some simple math leads that there's 1,500 daily DNS requests per user. Another site, visualeconomics.com, says that humans go to approximately uh, 89 different domains a month. Dividing that out to uh, per day leads to three domains. So while the typo squatters are busy going after three domains that people type in, bit squatting goes after the 1,497 that they don't. So you may be wondering, how can we leverage these uh, automated domain lookups? And the reason we can leverage them is because computers have problems. And I'm not talking about things like bad programming or buffer overflows or logic bugs. I'm talking about problems with hardware that it's running perfectly normal and well-written software. And uh, computers are imperfect. They're made by mere mortals to engineering standards. 
and engineering standards have tolerances. And they have things like a heat level they're willing to take, and uh, mean times between failure. And they encounter errors. One of the possible errors that you can encounter is called a bit error. And a bit error is uh, also referred to as a single upset event in literature. It's when the electrical or other representation of a 1 gets transformed into a 0, or when the electrical or other representation of a 0 gets transformed into a 1. And uh, it's important to realize that these bit errors occur in a context. They don't happen in a vacuum. When a bit changes from a 1 to a 0, that bit is a part of some informational structure in your memory. And this could be something like a linked list. It could be a hash. It could be login names. It could be credentials. It could be cached HTML somewhere in your web server. And uh, it could be in a domain name that you're about to look up. And uh, remember those 1,500 daily DNS queries? Sometimes uh, those queries are going to be wrong because a bit error occurred in the content you clicked on or somewhere along uh, the DNS path of what you were looking up. And bit errors are actually an ancient problem. They go back to the very beginning of computing. I don't know if you guys uh, in the back can tell what's going on here, but this man is replacing a vacuum tube. And uh, he's working on the ENIAC. The ENIAC was built before modern integrated circuit technology, or even transistors for that matter and it's used vacuum tubes for processing and storing information. And uh, these tubes failed, and they failed a lot. Uh, J. Presper Eckert is uh, one of the co-inventors of the ENIAC, and they had a tube failure about every two days. Whenever a vacuum tube would fail, the machine would either give incorrect results or it wouldn't work at all. And actually, an interesting tidbit, the longest operating time of the ENIAC without errors was actually five days, which is pretty long if you think of it as something that was never been made. But you know what? We no longer use vacuum tubes in our electronics, and we haven't for a bit. We switched to transistors and then to integrated circuits, and those have uh, really high reliability and nothing wrong would ever go with them. Right, guys? Well, not quite. Uh, this is a uh, RAM board from the MITS Altair 8800. The MITS Altair is actually quite a uh, historic computer. It ushered the mini computer revolution. The first Microsoft product was actually Altair Basic that ran on the MITS Altair. But that's not what we're going to discuss. We're actually going to discuss those uh, purple chips at the very top of that you see here. And uh, those purple chips are Intel 2107 DRAM chips. And what's interesting about them that in 1978, two engineers at Intel, uh, May and Woods, discovered that there were catastrophic failures in the Intel 2107 DRAM. And uh, they traced these failures back to the supply chain. And they found that what was causing these DRMs to fail is that Intel had made a new semiconductor plant that was downstream from an old uranium mine. And uh, this radioactive contamination would actually affect the chips during manufacture. So you would be using these chips, and an alpha particle would be emitted from the radioactive contaminant, and it would flip bits in the memory. And your application that was running on it, that was perfectly written, would catastrophically fail. But they published lots of papers on this. And this became a very well known in the semiconductor industry. And we put in new processes that would make sure that this would never happen again. Right, guys? Not quite. So this is uh, the Sun Ultra Spark 2 CPU. The one in the slide is from 1997. But the problem I'm going to talk about occurred in 2001. And that year, a lot of uh, Sun servers started really failing. And these were really expensive servers. And people would reboot them. They would run the self-tests on these servers, and everything would be fine. And then after a certain amount of time, they would catastrophically fail again. And uh, Sun got a lot of support calls. And eventually, some Sun engineers traced this problem all the way back to radioactive contamination in the L1 and L2 cache of the Sun UltraSpark 2. And to make matters worse, the uh, L1 and the L2 cache didn't have any error checking on them. So these errors would go unnoticed by the processor until your mission critical application would die. But clearly, these have to be uh, isolated events. And you know the semiconductor industry is pretty good. And they won't make mistakes. Like There wouldn't be any need to do to include, let's say, a hardware testing or a memory testing program with uh, every OS installation. 
but there is. This is a screenshot of a default Ubuntu installation, and uh, all Ubuntu installations come with Memtest 86. And the reason they come with Memtest 86 is because sometimes your memory will fail. And uh, I don't know, I'm not sure how many operating system vendors out there do some hardware memory testing, but it, I think it's always an optional step, but it's something you really should do. You never know if you're about to install on bad hardware. I imagine this happens more often than you would think. And uh, since researchers have known about bit errors for quite a long time, there have also been uh, several security implications of bit errors. And I'm not just talking about random data corruption. There is a lot of other things that can happen due to bit errors that don't include just corrupting critical data and crashing your mission critical applications. There's been a lot of previous work ranging from the academic to uh, practical and industry, and it varies the gamut from uh, breaking out of sandboxes to uh, extracting encryption keys out of uh, small devices. First previous work we're gonna look at is uh, JVM Sandbox Escape. Uh, in 2003, Sudakar and Apple of Princeton University published an extremely interesting paper in uh, IEEE S&P, and uh, they actually found a way to break out of the JVM sandbox using random bit errors. And the way this attack works is you uh, use the JVM to fill up memory with two Java objects and references to those objects. And you, then you wait for a bit error to change one of those references to point to a different object. And it turns out that once you have two differently typed references to the same object, you can actually create a write what where primitive, and once you're writing arbitrary executable code into memory, it's uh, pretty much game over. And uh, to demonstrate this, since the researchers couldn't wait around for a bit error to happen, what they did was they attached a heat lamp to their CPU, and uh, they would heat the RAM past the temperature of failure to induce bit errors. And they were actually able to experimentally demonstrate that their technique works using the apparatus you see in the slide. Another security implication of bit errors is smart card piracy. There's actually quite a war going on between set-top box manufacturers, cable TV operators, and smart card pirates, and it's well documented in the book Security Engineering by Ross Anderson. If you haven't read it, I would really recommend it. It's an awesome book, not just for this, but for a lot of other stuff. And one of the things that smart card pirates do is uh, they want to extract encryption keys out of the smart card. And the smart card uh, plugs into your cable TV box and it'll decrypt encrypted channels broadcast over satellite. And one of the ways they use this, they try to get this uh, encryption key is bit errors. So what they do is they attach to the bus of the smart card and then they will actually electrically probe the smart card CPU to try and cause it to uh, change its instruction pointer in the middle of a jump instruction to an instruction that they map their own code to. And once code is fetched from that memory address, they will actually feed the smart card code to dump contents from ROM memory. Now, there's uh, more causes of bit errors than just uh, smart card pirates and heat lamps. I'm going to uh, quickly discuss four of them, but they're certainly not completely inclusive. So, number one cause of bit errors, heat. As we saw with the heat lamp, heat causes bit errors. And the reason that heat causes bit errors is because materials like semiconductor materials and other materials have physical properties that are dependent on temperature. Physical properties like conductivity, resistivity, and capacitance. And when you heat up these materials past their operating temperature, then potentially the electrical information they store is going to change. And it'll change from a zero to a one, one to a zero, or maybe something else. And, uh, this isn't generally a problem for desktop hardware since usually you have pretty adequate cooling and heating in wherever these are used. But for mobile devices, this can be a big issue. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this screen. Maybe you have. Uh, if your iPhone gets too hot, that's what happens. Uh, but did you ever wonder what happens potentially before the screen goes up or what happens on devices that don't have a temperature sensor? Or uh, what temperature does this thing kick in anyway? So, here's a graph of uh, the iPhone operating temperature against uh, monthly average temperatures in two cities, one of which we're in right now. Uh, 
we're actually at the top of that uh, blue curve there since we're in August. I'm sure some of you who have been outside know this. And as you can see, it's uh, considerably above the iPhone operating temperature of 95 degrees. Also, if you uh, happen to be in Montreal in the winter and you use your iPhone, you should know that you're using it a lot below the operating temperature of 32 degrees. Now, uh, if you've used your iPhone outside today in the Vegas heat, congratulations, you've been using it outside the validated temperature range. So, next cause of bit errors, electrical problems. <clears throat> this slide is actually very apt. Uh, the caption for this image where I found it was that this is actually the backup power for a group of computers at a school in rural India. We are accustomed to uh, our computers having always on AC power that's extremely reliable in a modern power grid. This isn't true for large parts of the world. If you have really fluctuating power inputs into your electronic devices, they may fail and one of the failure cases may be bit errors. And uh, sometimes, whenever you feed in electricity to your devices, even if the power is bad, power, or even if the power is good, the device itself may be broken. This is a uh, pirate capacitor. There's actually uh, entire forums on the internet dedicated to just finding bad capacitors in motherboards and reporting them. And uh, capacitors aren't the only thing that can be pirated you can actually pirate a variety of electronic components, and some unscrupulous hardware manufacturers may tend to include these in uh, the computers they build. So I guess uh, next time whenever you're uh, putting something out for the lowest bidder, you may get exactly what you paid for, which uh, is not what you expected. Another problem is that even as we saw in very well manufactured and non pirated and completely above board operations, sometimes contamination can creep in. And sometimes the contamination can be radioactive. And uh, whenever these radioactive isotopes emit radiation, it will ionize the components next to it and change the electrical value representation. And speaking of radiation, we're gonna move on to uh, the last, but certainly not least, cause of bit errors, which is cosmic rays. And uh, one, yes, I'm serious. And I want to say I'm talking about the, uh, specifically I'm talking about the intergalactic cosmic rays, not the solar kind. So this picture is more than appropriate. From all the research I've done, the solar kind can't actually penetrate the upper atmosphere. So from, from those, we are safe. And the interesting thing about cosmic rays is they can affect even the most well-manufactured hardware. So let's say you're running comfortably in a data center with a reliable triple backup power supply and you're using the, very, the most expensive components and your cooling is working. You could still be vulnerable due to random cosmic rays hitting your hardware. And uh, far from being a theoretical nuisance, certain studies out there have actually concluded that cosmic rays are in fact the most prevalent source of bit errors at ground level. The uh, graph you see here is a direct copy from the IBM Journal of Research and Development, volume 40, number one, page 13, for those of you who want to look it up. And uh, the, the context of this is that IBM did a study on uh, DRAM failure rates following the discovery from the guys at Intel. And the study lasted from 1978 to 1994. And what they had found is that uh, cosmic rays tend to, affect, tend to affect DRAM quite considerably. Uh, what you see on this graph is uh, the measured experimental failure rate. So this is like th failures that they actually observed in their cache and in the DRAM. This isn't what they scientifically predicted. And the line you see, that's uh, the cosmic ray flux at altitude. So what they actually experimentally observed matched their prediction of co cosmic ray flux nearly completely. And uh, the reason they have cities up there is because cosmic ray flux tends to increase as you go up in altitude. So the higher up you are, the more chance you have of receiving a bit error due to cosmic rays. So what is the actual distribution of these events in uh, the bit errors you see? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Uh, I don't, for those of you who came in early, you saw a lot of uh, scrolling logs. I was tailing an HTTP log and my server of the requests coming in. And I can't really go halfway around the world and uh, look at somebody's iPhone and tell you what exactly caused the bit error on it. 
it's entirely possible that the cause of the bit error was something that I didn't even list. So I don't actually know what's going on, but I suspect it's one of the problems that I've listed. What I know for sure is that despite the cause, the bit errors are real, they happen, and they have security implications. To uh, continue our bit error discussion, I want to talk about DRAM. And the reason I want to talk about DRAM is DRAM makes up the uh, RAM in your computers. It's one of the places where information density is by far the highest. The components are difficult to cool, and uh, vendors are often under pressure to store some very cheaply. Additionally, DRAM is uh, the, the component that the vast majority of previous studies have focused their bit error research on. Now, I'm going to give you guys some good news. And the good news is that there is a solution for all bit errors in DRAM. It's called ECC, or Error Correcting Codes. And ECC will detect all single bit errors. And uh, there's actually versions of ECC that will detect all one, two, three, and four bit errors. But ECC only works if you actually use it. There's uh, probably some of you in the audience thinking that you're well off. You know, you manage a giant rack of enterprise class servers. You bought them from somewhere decent. Then most hardware manufacturers are well aware of bit errors. That's why when you buy a server, you can generally only get ECC main memory in it. But I want to ask you, did you count all of the RAM in your machine? My answer is you probably didn't. For example, uh, this is an enterprise class SAS drive pulled from a server with complete ECC RAM. The uh, chip highlighted there in yellow is a 128 megabit DRAM. That 128 megabit DRAM does not have ECC. And uh, this, actually, this drive is actually a few years old. So newer 128 megabits is 16 megabytes. So that drive had 16 megabytes of cache. Today, uh, even consumer class drives have 32 or even 64 megabyte caches. Enterprise class servers tend to have uh, anywhere between five and eight of these drives in a RAID configuration. So if you multiply 64 megabytes by eight, you get a lot of non-ECC DRAM running in your Michigan critical server. And uh, hard drives isn't the only place where non-ECC DRAM may sneak up on you. There's uh, other places, for example, your RAID controller, or your uh, NIC, or maybe even your keyboard controller. And uh, now that you probably assume that there's some non-ECC DRAM uh, in your machine that will, is subject to bit errors that aren't going to get caught and aren't going to get corrected, let's look at some DRAM failure rates. So this slide uh, summarizes several studies on DRAM failure rates. There's two main ones. One is by Terrazon Semiconductor, concluded in 2004. And one is by uh, Schroeder from the University of Toronto in association with some people from Google. And uh, first thing to notice is that this slide is actually in a logarithmic scale. It goes from 1 to 100,000. And the lowest uh, error rate here measured in failures and tests. And failures and tests here means uh, one error in 1 billion hours of operation. So the lowest error rate is about 50 failures in test, and the higher rate rate is about 100,000 failures in test. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is the, the manufacturer one to manufacturer six, those results come from uh, the Schroeder study, which actually measured bit errors in Google servers in Google's data centers. So this is actually using real hardware, and it was concluded in 2009, real relatively recent hardware. And they found a definitely considerable amount of errors, the good news, I guess, from that study is that what they observed is that the vast majority of errors occurred in the same DIMMs. So unlike the previous IBM study, the Google study would imply that the failure is actually due to various manufacturing defects. So once bad RAM is identified, it might be possible to replace it. Uh, I said this study is in failures and tests, which measure a failure in a billion hours of operation. And uh, we're really not used to thinking of failures and tests. So I've got a nice summary for you of what this means in real terms. Uh, PC with four gigabytes of DRAM is uh, about what you can buy from Dell. Like if you go on the Dell website right now and you, buy, and you want to buy a laptop, the cheapest one they're going to advertise to you on the front page will have four gigabytes of RAM. Assuming uh, the lowest error estimates from the previous slide, that laptop will encounter about three bit errors per month. 
assuming the highest estimates, it'll encounter 3 bit errors per hour. But what, uh, what's really intuitive about bit squatting is that it doesn't matter about the bit errors in a single computer. What we're interested in is about the bit errors in all the RAM that's connected to the internet. And it's actually possible to estimate how much that is. So there are several studies have said that there were 5 billion internet connected devices in 2010. Assuming that you have an average of 128 megabytes of RAM per device, and this assumption is not scientifically founded. I couldn't find any good estimates anywhere I looked, but I figured 128 megabytes was fair. There's multi-gigabyte desktops and servers connected to the internet, and there's also phones with maybe six megabytes. 128 seemed like a reasonable compromise. If you multiply out all of that, you will get that there is 600 petabytes of RAM connected to the internet. And uh, that 600 petabytes of RAM is approximately equivalent to one day's, inter one days of internet traffic, and that 600 petabytes certainly encounters bit errors. If uh, you use the lower end estimates from the sli you slide you saw a few slides ago, there will be an estimated 600,000 bit errors in all of the world's DRAM that occur per day. But we want to that doesn't really matter that much because out of the 600,000 bit errors, how many of those bit errors actually occur somewhere that is interesting? Well, to measure that, set up an experiment to find out. The uh, experiment consists of three main stages. The first stage is to register domains that are one bit away from popular domains. And what exactly that means, I'll get into shortly. The second stage of the experiment is to uh, supply DNS resolution for those domains, which is actually non-trivial. And I will walk you through step by step with the process. And uh, the third step is set up an HTTP listener and log all requests and see what you can find out about the people visiting BitSquats. So experiment step one, register domains one bit away from common domains. This uh, contains the domains I actually register, delineated by, into several categories by the horizontal lines. And uh, these are of uh, certain popular websites, such as Microsoft and Amazon, and more importantly, of uh, content delivery and advertising networks. And, um, the reason I chose content delivery and advertising networks is because there, nobody ever types them in. Like, you never want to go, you never type in the long URL for CDN or to view an ad in your browser, but they're looked up all the time in the background in your browsing sessions. And uh, also, just for fun, I figured I'd register root servers to see if I could uh, spoof anybody's DNS root. So step two is you have to respond to DNS. And uh, how exactly to do this is best illustrated by a multi-step example. So let's pretend that somebody's recursive resolver is requesting mic2osoft.com, which I can answer authoritatively for. You get the request, and naturally, you reply with an A record response saying, hey, I've got mic2osoft right here. It's at this IP address. But we think that the, that the DNS server possibly encountered a bit error. So it's not enough to reply for the BitSquat domain. It's also extremely important to send a second reply for the original domain. Because when the DNS server that sent the query, if it encountered a bit error, it will not be expecting a response for MIC Tuosoft. It'll be expecting a response for Microsoft. And we return the Microsoft response back to the DNS server. Once again, to uh, walk you through the three-stage process, you receive an A record request. And this doesn't actually have to be an A record. You have to answer all records, such as NS, for example. You receive a DNS request. And for every DNS request you receive, you send back two replies, one for the BitSquat domain, one for the original domain. And uh, experiment step three is once you uh, set up an HTTP listener, I chose Apache because it's extremely simple and has everything I need. You set up an HTTP listener. Eventually, somebody will request some resource from you. And I chose to reply with an HTTP 404 not found. 
Uh, it was really dangerous to reply with any content. I was extremely concerned about what would happen to people who are requesting random resources from me. I assumed that a 404 was the safest bet, so I chose to reply with nothing. So, once again, somebody will eventually contact you. You will have to then log all of the data from that HTTP request, so the domain they requested, the URL they requested, their user agent, and the IP address they're coming from, and then respond to them with a 404. So, interestingly enough, once you register those domains and you set up your DNS listener and you set up your HTTP server, people actually show up. That was by far the biggest surprise of this entire experiment is that it actually worked, and I was surprised to the actual scale of how well it worked. This is a uh, raw traffic log volume. These are raw requests, so for this is all the HTTP requests they've had from so multiple requests from the same AP address count in here. And uh, as you see, there's a steady background of just random traffic. And every so often, it is ex there's these uh, extraneous events where traffic just spikes up. The most I've seen was around 3,500 different HTTP requests per day. Was that from mostly one host, or was that? I'm going to get into that in the very next slide. Thank you for asking. Uh, I wouldn't say I will get into that in the very next slide, has uh, traffic by unique IP address. But I wanted to say is that sometimes you get an error in something like a uh, proxy server, and that you would get a lot of traffic for various URLs, all from uh, the same IP, but it would be for different users. But I did think that that would not be a fair measurement, so I filtered this by unique IP address. And uh, you can see a lot of the peaks disappear. Because what also happens is when people receive a 404 error, either automatically or manually, they will actually keep reloading, and those reloads add up. Uh, even in uh, the unique IP view, you see that there's huge spikes that I've labeled uh, events A, event B, and event C. And event A was actually 1,600 different unique IP addresses that visited me on that day. These are all actually very interesting, and I'm going to get into what exactly occurred in each event in the next series of slides. Uh, event A, that was 16, more than 1,600 APs. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, there's a certain very popular web application that people love to use that uh, caused this event, and that application is Farmville. And uh, yes, yes, I'm serious. <laughs> Uh, the reason I say 1,300 here is because uh, only 1,300 were directly attributable to it. The rest were attributable to some other stuff that I'd have to research into a little more. So how did it happen that all of these uh, Farmville users were requesting random HTTP URLs from me? Well, I have a step-by-step uh, -step explanation of exactly what happened. So step one, you're somewhere on the internet and you decide that your day is pretty boring and you want to play some Farmville. Step two, you uh, request some resources from Facebook or from Farmville, and a bit error occurs somewhere in the Farmville server. This is actually the exact bit error that happened. The normal URL is profile.ak.fbcdn.net, but I guess two bit errors occurred here and it changed to pbofile.ak.fbbdn.net. I happen to own fbbdn.net. <laughs> and so whenever you would request an ad, you would request it from me instead of from the Facebook content delivery network. And the interesting thing that I'd like to point out here is that this bit error actually was cached by the Facebook server, or it occurred in the Facebook server cache. And when 1,300 different people went to request that URL, what happened was that they actually went to me instead of going to the Facebook content delivery network. And of course, at that point, I can send them anything I want. But I chose to send a 404. Yes, I see a hand there. Uh, when you send back the, uh, the uh, I would have to double check whatever was from the Python script that I found that originally did it. I have found a Python script that was a Python DNS server. I motiv modified it to send two replies instead of one, and it was effective enough to work. I do not exactly remember the TTL, but I can double check for you if you can contact me later. 
And uh, as the final overview, to see exactly what happened, you're somebody, you go, you play Farmville, a bit error occurs in Facebook or at Farmville, it gets cached, it gets served up to 1,300 different people, and uh, they all request an ad from you, and, this, and then you serve them up whatever you want, in this case, 404s. So uh, let's go on to the next event, event B. Uh, you saw that there was another big spike there. Uh, anybody care to guess what event B was? It was actually also Farmville. <laughs> Uh, this time affecting 156 different unique IPs. And uh, what was the reason? It was actually also pretty much the exact same thing, only a different bit error. This time, instead of being in uh, fbbdn.net, the bit error changed fbcdn.net to fbgdn.net, which I also own. And so people out there would go play Farmville. They would request an ad from Facebook, and uh, their bit error would occur, it would either occur in the cache, or the error would get cached, and then it would get served up to people until that object cache was refreshed. So uh, if you're developing some sort of a caching system that uses memory cache, you should uh, really make sure what you put in is what you get out. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to move on to uh, the next event, event C. And I promise this one's not Farmville. <laughs> event C is. Uh, actually a lot more interesting than either event A or event B. Well, maybe, depending how you look at it. And uh, event C is actually DNS poisoning caused by random bit errors. So when uh, I started looking at my HTTP logs, I noticed that for uh, event C, all of the uh, source IPs were from the same slash 24. So hmm, that's a little odd. I haven't really encountered this before. So I began to look more, and I noticed that they were also for the same domain. And eventually I realized that what had to have happened is that the recursive server for the slash 24 was DNS poisoned, and it was DNS poisoned to uh, redirect people from the ad network to uh, my domain. And I have a step-by-step -step view of exactly what happened. So let's say you're uh, some user in that slash 24, and you want to resolve s0.2mdn.net, which is actually an extremely popular advertising network. You may have never typed it in, but if you look, your browser will request it a lot. You request s0.2mdn.net. It goes to your local recursive server. It, the entry has expired in your local recursive, and your local recursive will uh, encounter a bit error, and it'll instead want to query something like s0.2-dn.net, which I happen to own, and uh, of course, as we saw, for uh, every DNS query you get, it's extremely important to send two replies. And for, you send a rep one of the replies for s0.2mdn.net. And that reply is received by the recursive resolver. And then it's forwarded on to the original requester. And the original requester will then uh, contact me for an ad. And now, since that DNS server has cached the entry, everybody from that slash 24 who requests an ad from s0.2mdn.net will actually silently be redirected to me. And it's important to realize that these people were just browsing the internet, and I had did nothing to their machine, I did absolutely nothing active, and entirely passively, I was able to redirect their connections to a completely different server and uh, potentially serve them up JavaScript in their web browsing sessions without their knowledge or without them doing anything against common security practices. Luckily for them, I was serving up 404s. But if it was somebody who was uh, malicious, they could have served them up whatever they wanted. Once again, to review the full set, Somebody requests s0.2mdn.net. The cache entry has expired in the local recursive server. A bit error occurs during request time, and instead, s0.2-dn.net is requested. I reply with uh, the answer for s0.2mdn.net, and uh, that reply is forwarded on to the requesting host. From then on, until the cache entry expires, that entire slash 24, when asking for s0.2mdn.net, gets redirected somewhere else. Now uh, that we've explained away the three different outliers, 
let's look at the traffic that, are, let's look at a view of the traffic by unique IP address without the outliers present. So uh, I want to point out those gaps is where the outliers were, they are now removed. And that blue line is uh, the average amount of unique IPs per day, not counting the outlying events. And uh, that's about 59. So the first takeaway from this is that not all bit errors are created equal. Some bit errors are, uh, in effect, a lot more valuable than others. They would occur somewhere such as a uh, ad content server or a DNS server and redirect a large number of users. Some occur in your host machine and perhaps will only ever affect one user. But uh, I think that 59 different unique IP addresses per day using only about 32 domains is still a pretty interesting accomplishment. This could be easily scaled up by anybody with even modest resources to uh, include a lot more users. Uh, next thing I wanted to graph was uh, the traffic volume by hour. And uh, first thing is, uh, this is only for those IP addresses geolocated to be from the United States. Uh, the reason I did that was because I didn't want to do time zone mapping from around the world to something co coherent. So I chose United States, and I normalized everything to uh, Eastern time. The original reason I did this mapping was uh, because I had suspected that during warmer parts of the day, there would be more bit error since, you know, there'd be more heat to affect outdoor electronics. But uh, I, it's actually turns out that it's really difficult to uh, separate bit errors potentially induced from heat because it turns out that most people just use their computers in the daytime. So what's interesting is that this graph actually nearly exactly matches uh, the normal internet traffic graph for uh, North America. And the interesting thing behind that is that it means that it is likely a random process that is redirecting a random amount of users to my domains instead of, instead of it being some specific vulnerability that's out there. And as you can see, uh, about uh, 8 a.m., everything starts to rise. And about 2 p.m., there's a steady level. And then once again, it drops off as uh, North American internet use uh, dies around midnight. And this is cyclical. So I also got the uh, user agent headers for all of these people requesting my BitSquat domains. And I figured, hey, it'd be interesting to see what operating system these guys are running. And these are the uh, operating system statistics of people requesting BitSquat domains to, uh, people requesting the, to people requesting Wikipedia. And this is the visitors of Wikipedia for March of 2011. So let's start with the commonalities. First is, of course, there's a huge chunk of Windows machines, which is absolutely to be expected because, well, there's a lot of Windows users in the world. Then uh, we see there's about uh, 3% of the iPhone users iPhone is a very popular phone. It's used a lot outdoors, not completely unprecedented that there would be a lot of bit errors. And uh, there's about 1% 1, 1 Linux users and about 1% uh, Android users. The differences, though, is uh, what's particularly striking. What I still can't explain is uh, why there are so many fewer Mac visitors for bit squads. I'm not actually sure what that is. I don't have a reasonable explanation. I have suspicions that maybe it's either better build quality or the aluminum casing is shielding you from cosmic rays. <laughs> don't really know. But for an unexplained reason, there's a lot fewer Macs. And what's interesting also is that there's a lot more of the other. And this other includes a wide variety of personal entertainment, mobile, and set-top devices. And this is thing like, PlayStation Portables, uh, Nintendo Wiis, PlayStation 3s, and various phones by Samsungs. I've seen Motorola's. I've seen Blackberries. A lot of these will also tell you what carrier they're running in their user agent string. I still have not been able to figure out the utility of that. And uh, the disparity between mobile devices and non-mobile devices was actually to be expected. Because if you think about it, mobile devices are under a lot more stress. You, you throw them, you use them outside, use them when it's cold. It's certainly expected that there would be a lot more mobile bit squats, and that is actually what we see. So where are these people coming from? 
I used the MaxMine GeoAP database to geolocate all of the APs that were visiting my BitSquads. And the results are actually extremely surprising. The top three are China, Brazil, United States, followed by Great Britain, then by Israel, Italy, and Germany. And the surprising fact about this is that this doesn't match population, this doesn't match internet traffic, and this doesn't match the amount of computers. Uh, I don't actually have a solid explanation as to the differences in various GOIP data, but my suspicion is that, as we noticed before, is not all bit squats are created equal. Sometimes a bit error occurs in a lot more useful of a target, if you think about it as uh, winning the uh, bit squat lottery. So maybe it's entirely possible that the, I just happened to get a bit squat in a really popular Chinese or Brazilian server that's requested a lot and was able to redirect traffic to me. But further research needs to be done to figure out exactly why there is such a disparity. And next, which domains uh, are these people requesting? The most popular, of course, is Facebook. And the most reason Facebook is the most popular is because the disk graph includes uh, all of the outlier requests. Followed by uh, Microsoft, followed by 2MDN.net, that advertising domain, followed by some bit squats of uh, DoubleClick and other content delivery networks. Uh, if you notice, there's also MSN.com in this top 25 list. And if you recall uh, a few slides back where I'd listed my bit squat domains, I didn't bit squat MSN.com. So how was this traffic headed for MSN.com and also uh, S-MSN.com headed to my bit squat servers? I actually have a very good explanation. But before I can accurately explain that, I want to explain the two paths where bit errors occur. One of these is the DNS path. And uh, the DNS path is uh, a bit error that occurs somewhere during name resolution. And one of the bit errors is during the content path, such as what we saw with uh, the Farmville episode. And that bit error happens before you ever request a domain name. The content is already corrupted, and then it arrives at your machine, and your DNS works fine. And I can actually tell apart which uh, path the bit squat took from my HTTP logs. First, uh, we'll examine exactly how this works via the DNS path. So for, as I said, for the DNS path, it means that an error had to occur somewhere in the DNS resolution path. And we'll start with an example. So somebody requests the uh, A record for fbcdn.net. That A record goes to a recursive resolver, and a bit error occurs somewhere. And instead of fbcdn.net, uh, that recursive resolver starts requesting fbbdn.net. And of course, that's controlled by me. I send the two DNS replies, and I say, hey, I've got fbbdn.net and fbcdn.net right here. Come on down. And uh, what's important to see next is the, uh, when the host receives the DNS reply and actually makes a request at the web server, its host header will have fbcdn.net. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with HTTP 1.1, it requires that you supply a host header in every HTTP request. And the host header contains the domain that you think you're actually connecting to. So if a bit error occurred somewhere in the DNS path, then the host header will be FB will be the uh, non-bit squatter domain. It'll be the original domain. And since they came to me, I know that obviously a bit error occurred in the DNS path, or it would have came to where it was intended to go. And of course, afterwards, you can send them whatever you want after you log the request. Uh, as the overview, you get an a, a recursive server receives an A record request. Uh, a bit error occurs, and it goes to me. I reply with the original. I reply with a request for the original name. That gets forwarded onto the original requesting host. An HTTP connection is made, and in the host header, it says fbcdn.net instead of fbbdn.net, and I know that that bit error occurred because of DNS. And uh, on to bit errors in the content path. And this is the bit errors that happen before DNS ever has a chance to work. So step one. You, let's say you uh, go to browse Facebook. Then uh, a bit error occurs somewhere in the Facebook server or at some advertising network. 
And let's say that maybe this bit error occurred in an image or it occurred in uh, the SRC element of a JavaScript. And you get served that content, and when you fetch the content, you are actually going to fetch it from my server. And when you fetch it, you will have a host header of fbbdn.net instead of fbcdn.net. So I will know that that bit error occurred before DNS even had a chance to work. The bit error was in the content. So whenever you requested something and the host header is fbbdn.net, I know that your DNS is probably fine, but a bit error occurred somewhere else. And of course, after you log the request, you can forward it on. Once again, the full overview. You browse Facebook. Problem occurs somewhere in the content provider. The con you uh, get a bad content served to your browser, or maybe not even bad content. Maybe the bit error happened somewhere in your memory. Maybe it's in the parsed HTML in your mobile device because it's really hot out. Then you request the content from me, and I know by the host header that it wasn't a problem in DNS, that it was in fact a problem in the content, and then I reply with whatever I'd like. So what's the breakdown of a content path versus a DNS path? Uh, interestingly enough, and this includes all the outliers, 96% of all the requests they saw were from the content path. So for 96% of the requests, DNS is working just fine, but a bit error occurred somewhere in the content provider. And for 3% of the cases, it was definitely a problem in DNS, and 1% uh, of the domains were other, and that can actually also be attributed to a problem in DNS, which I will describe next. That's why I was able to get msn.com. But the interesting takeaway from this uh, graph is that there's been a lot of talk about DNS security and securing the DNS infrastructure, and it'll certainly work. It's very helpful, but deploying it will only protect about 4% uh, of bit squad errors. For the other 96%, you need to start protecting the content infrastructure. Yes, there's a question back there. I'm sorry, I can't really hear you. Could you please come, come up? Uh, it would. I know that the Mac Pros have ECC RAM, but I believe the MacBooks do not. So yes, potentially. Uh, so uh, getting back to this, the 1% uh, of the domains are uh, other. And uh, how do I get these other domains, which I didn't bit squat, to redirect it to my server? And uh, the answer is really long C name chains. These are used for uh, content delivery networks a lot of the time. And a C name chain is uh, when you try to re request the resolution of a name, the DNS server says, hey, this, uh, sure, you asked for ax init at iTunes at apple.com. But uh, ax init at iTunes at apple.com is actually a C name for ax init at iTunes at apple.com dot edge suite dot net, which is actually a name for something on Akamai, and that thing resolves. And if a bit error occurs and it corrupts one of these entries somewhere in the C name chain, your request will get redirected to me. And uh, this is actually a regular request that I observed. Like, I got a request for apple.com, despite the fact that I didn't bit squat it. But I did bit squat akamai.net. So what happened is that whenever the, the C name chain was being traversed, a bit error happened somewhere along it, and that DNS request got redirected to me. So uh, C name chains are uh, probably not a good idea, and if you can do without them, you probably should. And uh, speaking of these other domains, it's time for uh, some real live examples of traffic. I apologize that these are small and some of you may not be able to see them, but I really couldn't think of a better way to get these across. Uh, this is a random sampling of other domains, and this is uh, actual HTTP log entries that I saw on my server. Uh, this isn't a complete list of other domains. This is just all I could fit on a single slide. I didn't want to give you too much of this. Uh, so the very top one is, of course, the ax.init.itunes.apple.com. I believe that was actually somebody trying to activate their iPhone. Maybe somebody with more details can confirm or deny this, but I can only assume they were not successful. There's some for uh, various ad networks. 
And I actually got a surprisingly large amount for MSN because of uh, the various Microsoft bit squats that I have. And if you see that a lot of these people are actually not just requesting images, but requesting full HTML pages from what they think is a trusted source. And this is definitely something to be careful about because it's very easy for a fisher to set one of these up and serve you up phishing pages, and you would never know. So next real example, Facebook. If you notice, uh, a lot of people request JavaScript from my domains while they're browsing in their Facebook sessions. Uh, I could easily steal their Facebook credentials or uh, their session cookies. Of course, they instead got 404s, but somebody malicious could uh, definitely use this to their advantage. And uh, if you look at the browsers, it includes pretty much everything, including even uh, one Android user. So just because you're using an obscure platform, it doesn't mean that you're safe from bit squatting attacks. Uh, next example set, Windows Update, one of my favorite ones. Uh, you can see a few people requesting the Windows Update self-update cab from me. Uh, if, you could, if you could do this, you could potentially supply them binary code. I, it's obvious that some of these machines have uh, problems. You could see one of them had their for request of Windows Update F agent instead of Windows Update agent. Uh, I've also had peop the very bottom request is uh, somebody actually requesting a uh, binary.exe from me. Next example set. People requesting advertisements while they're logged into their webmail. Uh, the two up there are from uh, MSN Hotmail, but I don't want to pick an MSN Hotmail. These are just the first two I was able to find. I've, there was actually a variety of webmail requests that requested stuff from me. I believe Yahoo was also one of them, if not more. And the third one is from some other provider. Uh, requesting ads, sorry, requesting JavaScript from uh, a random website while you're checking your webmail, not a good idea. I'm sure uh, all you guys can definitely realize that. Next example, Windows crash report. So, uh, so one of the criticisms I got when I was uh, discussing this with people is that this bit squatting thing will never work. If a machine were to have a bit error, it's just going to crash and you will never get anything useful out of it. Well, that may be true some of the time. I'm not discounting that. Other times it stays up and there's times when it crashes and you get something useful out of it. Uh, my favorite is the one in the middle there with a notepad.exe. We all know uh, how uh, terrible and complex that is and how many data formats it parses. Uh, the top one is uh, Acrobat Reader. That one might have actually been legitimate. I mean, I never know. And the interesting thing about error reporting is that I believe it's actually possible to, uh, if you're on the receiving end of the error report, I don't know the protocol in detail, but I know one of the things that can be sent up is uh, the entire memory contents of your machine. So it's entirely possible that somebody malicious could do this, and once they receive requests for error report, saying, hey, please give me a full RAM dump. I'd like to debug this problem further. Uh, and that would include whatever browsing sessions you had or whatever you were doing whenever you encountered this bit error. So something to definitely be concerned about. By now, I hope you've realized that bit errors are a legitimately real problem and something you should be concerned about. And uh, we're going to go on to uh, some mitigations. So mitigation number one, ECC on everything. ECC is a very old and mature solution. It's extremely widely deployed, and you should really use it. Uh, if somebody in here is responsible for uh, the bill of materials for the next cool mobile device or for the next PC, or if you work for a PC manufacturer, please include ECC RAM. Your users will thank you. And uh, if you uh, make, are making various hard drives or other peripheral devices, please include ECC RAM on those as well. They go in a lot of enterprise stuff, and you don't want bit errors to happen. Uh, mitigation number two. I'm actually not certain, but I believe you're correct. Those chipsets do not support ECC, but they really should. Well, hopefully we'll put it back in. <laughs> uh, mitigation number two is pre-register domains. This is actually the easiest thing to do, since uh, the 
the mains that are most affected by bit squats are those extremely widely requested, since these errors happen actually relatively infrequently. If you consider all of the volume for Microsoft.com and the fraction that I see, it's actually very small. So you only have to worry about this is if your domain is extremely popular. So on the plus side is the people who have the most popular domains have the most money to register them. So this is one of those cases where the problem goes to those who are most able to solve it. Uh, and actually, there's not that many domains you have to worry about. For a one-bit error, uh, if you take one ASCII character, the most uh, bit squats of that character can be six. So six times the length of your domain is how much money you need to spend to uh, pre-register all of those domains to ensure that somebody else doesn't get them first. And this will help your users today. Like, if you register these, it'll help them right now. Even the ones running in some hot country with really bad hardware and bad memory with really bad electrical supplies. Uh, mitigation number three is uh, trust but verify your data. As we saw, 96% of these errors were in the content path. I know a lot of uh, Web 2.0 systems run on extensive memory caching because they don't want to hit the database. If you're designing these extensive memory cache systems, please include a CRC somewhere to ensure that the data you put in is the data that you send out. You're probably limited by network bandwidth anyway, and modern CPUs actually have CRC32 instructions. Doing CRCs of this should actually be relatively cheap, and it would be extremely helpful, especially if your uh, software ends up running in the machine without ECC RAM. This is something to also think about for mobile device manufacturers. If you're uh, writing software that's, doing, that's using critical data, such as DNS queries, maybe you should include a CRC32 of that as well to ensure that the query you send out is actually the domain name that appeared in the link that the person clicked on. There's uh, also avenues for future research. Currently, it's only possible to uh, bit squat second level domains. But uh, it seems ICANN has approved a historic change to the domain name system to where now you can register generic top-level domains. It may be entirely possible for somebody to register .com and bit squat all of the traffic to .com. I sincerely hope that people from ICANN take note and that they disallow registering of bit squats for at least the really popular TLDs or maybe disallowing a registration of bit squats in general. But that's uh, something to do uh, for future research. Another interesting area of future research is uh, punicode. There's also internationalized domains allowed, and those are represented eventually in uh, unsigned ASCII. So I'm not sure exactly what effects bit errors would have on popular punicode domains once they arrive, but it's certainly something to investigate. It may be possible to register a domain that completely, does, completely doesn't look anything like the Punicode domain or in a different language, but be one bit away from something that's popular. So to uh, conclude, I would like to give a special thanks to Robert Edmonds, without whose uh, work at ISC and uh, this research would have never been possible, to uh, Paul Royal for his invaluable help in uh, helping me write my paper and his reviews, to Aaron Lamasters for his uh, excellent adversarial discussions and ensuring that my presentation is polished, to uh, the entire Raytheon Roslyn office who uh, put up with me burgling their time to review my slides, to uh, the patient and supportive reviewers who I sent my slides out to and send my paper out to for many, many revisions, and of course to the Black Hat staff for letting me talk to you about bit squatting. Additionally, hold on guys, there's a few more. I'm really, I'm, this takes a bit. Additionally, I would like to thank everybody who uh, licenses their images under Creative Commons. Without you, my presentation would have never been possible. Thank you. And uh, now we'll go in for some questions. And please remember to uh, fill out your feedback form. Yes?
That's actually a very good point. Another thing that I'm interested in is whether routers have ECC memory or not. My Googling returned mixed results. It appears some of the older models actually do not have ECC RAM, but the newer ones do. A lot of them don't in a uh, they should probably reconsider. <laughs> is there uh, anybody else? Uh, yes? Yep. I wildcarded. I wildcarded. For anything, any third level names, I automatically responded with the same IP. Yes. I didn't. I only did it for one of them. Yes, the gentleman. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I can't quite hear you. Uh, I'm, not sure, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. I imagine I would have dropped it. I don't think I would have received it. But it's entirely possible that you can also IP squat by hoping for DNS errors and RR sets instead of DNS errors and queries. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the reason I even started this work is because of Robert Edmonds, who works at ISC, and he uh, does their SIE data, and that shows DNS queries from around the world. And uh, one day I was talking to him, and he's like, oh, I noticed that uh, all of these people are asking for domains with bit errors in them. And so then I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. What would happen if I actually registered them? So yes, you definitely do see the evidence of that at the domain server level. Is there uh, anybody else? Yes? Yep. Yep. Uh, because you suspect that a bit error happened somewhere in the guy that sent you the query. So if you receive a DNS error for a bit error domain, that what the response you're expecting back is probably for the normal domain. And so you want to make sure that your response matches what they thought you were going to tell them. Otherwise, they would drop the response. Anyone else, or is that it? Oh, sorry, I didn't see you guys. Uh, all of the ones from Google were taken. I don't know if all of them are by Google. I don't know, because a lot of the Google ones are also really close to typos, and everybody wants to go after Google. What's that? Uh, none. The, actually, the biggest source of errors I got is that if you set up a, a public web server, you get a lot of people just doing random web vulnerability scanning against you and a lot of search engine crawlers. So it actually took a lot of manual filtering to remove those. And I think I got all of them, but I'm sure it's not 100% clean. Oh, also, I wanted to say uh, I have a Python script that you can use to, uh, I, like, you give it a domain name, it'll tell you all of the potential available bit squats of it. If you guys want to do some quick testing with any domains that you may be interested in, you can download it from uh, dynaberg.org. Uh, yep. Uh, I'm not familiar with it, but it seems like it could be possible. The problem is you may have to wait a really long time for a bit error to happen in a specific target. The great thing about bit squatting is that you don't need a specific target. You just care that a bit error happens. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>